Hey everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, July 29th, 2012. Billy fired Phyllis this week. Surely she could not have been surprised. <laughs> it was coming from a mile away. Billy, I think, had to make this decision. He was working on the Restless Style TV show for months and months. And at the last minute, the TV executives decided that they weren't going to run the pilot. They weren't going to go ahead with the TV show when the editor-in-chief is under major criminal suspicion here. So <laughs> Billy, in I think a kind of brilliant way, decided to flip the script and fire Phyllis and make her the attention of the pilot and write, you know, huge exposés on everything that she's done. And I think, honestly, that is the most interesting part of the storyline. I was glad to get a little bit of a break from Phyllis's trial or the criminal issues this week. It's just been too much. Too many courtrooms and too much drama that is has been done before. I guess that's mostly sums up how I feel. I think that the most interesting part of this and the most, the, getting the most justice on Phyllis is writing this article about her. This is what I love to see. She's done it to everyone in Genoa City for years. And now it's all being turned on her. Billy is going to be splattering all of her dirty details in black and white all over the pages of Restless Style, all over TV screens everywhere, all over internet screens everywhere. And Phyllis was, of course, crushed that she lost her job. But what really got to her, probably even more than the trial, was the fact that these articles were going to start coming out and that she feels that she can't defend herself. She has the, the the criminal trial going on right now, so her lawyer Avery is advising her not to speak out, and she wants to. She wants to tell her side of the story. She's a journalist. She wants to tell her side of the story, and she's being suppressed. I can't imagine how long that's going to last <laughs> before she starts spouting her mouth off and saying what she needs to say, but for now, she's keeping quiet, and she's hurt. She's very hurt by the fact that her, her, her own own boss, her own, the company she's worked for is now turning on her. And even more upset <laughs> about the whole thing was Nick. Nick's going through some issues. You kind of got to feel sorry for the guy because he thought his life was going just fine. Everything with, you know, his marriage and his family was starting to get right on track. Phyllis and he have only been married for a couple of weeks now. And all of a sudden, he realizes that his wife is now being uh, under suspicion for a hit and run, an attempted murder charge. And not only that, but once again, he's going to have to defend his family against restless style of onslaught of accusations and gossip and Nick is at the end of his rope I think that he wanted to leave Phyllis last week his first reaction was I can't deal with this anymore I gotta get out and now he's decided that he's gonna support Phyllis and that means fighting for her when she's weak he wants to fight for her so he goes straight to restless style, doesn't ask any questions, doesn't take any names, hauls off and hits Billy right in the face, just punches him, wham, 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 <laughs> so good. Like that's the interesting part to me. Any time anybody gets hit or punched, that's, it's noteworthy. <laughs> like you could sit, have scenes of people sitting in courtrooms all day long and in that stupid questioning room at the police office or at the police station all day long. Don't don't care. A split second of somebody getting punched in the face is um, it outshines all of that ten times, a hundred times. So it was it was funny to see Nick punching Billy, but at the same time, come on, man, Billy isn't the one that caused the problem. This is Phyllis's problem, and they're not doing anything to Phyllis that she wouldn't have done to them. So I think Nick needed to back off. And of course, Nick has never really been known for his subtle tactics. He has used brute force more than once in his lifetime, and it had major entertainment value for us. On the other hand, though, <clears throat> I can see the opposite 
side because Billy <laughs> has decided that okay Nick punched me nothing I can do about that but I do have a source of retaliation because after the whole punch happened one of the camera crew guys or tech guys came to Billy to let him know that the entire office is wired with video so uh, that whole confrontation was caught on tape and it's just too juicy it's just too juicy to not do anything with it Billy immediately wants to publish it put it all out there it makes first of all it's sensational but second of all it makes it Phyllis look more guilty that Nick felt like he had to go out there and be her bodyguard for all of this stuff that's going on it just makes them look more guilty but the one thing standing in the way of Billy just putting this information out onto the internet and everywhere was Victoria. She was the last line of defense and Billy, out of respect for his wife, wanted to ask her if he could use this footage um, and, and as part of his article. And Victoria, of course, was ticked off to learn that her brother punched her husband in the face, but was kind of surprised that Victoria was okay with Billy using the footage. I, I just think that Victoria and everyone in the Newman family has spent so much time defending themselves against restless style attacks and now Victoria is knowingly going to exploit her family for a TV show. It just doesn't seem in, in character. The, Billy and Victoria have even just recently gone, gone kind of head to head uh, talking about how she doesn't want Billy to publish articles about her family and now all of a sudden she just caves in on that. Victoria has become a Billy bot. <laughs> she really has. He's, she's of his mind. Like he's gotten into her mind and she now I think just does what he says. I think she goes along with what he says. I'm not sure that they have a se two separate brains at this point. I think Billy and Victoria are thinking as one unit <laughs> at this point. So I don't know. I thought that that was very shocking that she decided to let him go ahead and run with this whole Phyllis story because like it the videotape between Nick and Billy ha really kind of wasn't about Phyllis. I mean, it was, but it also wasn't. It wasn't integral to the story. It was sensational, but Billy could have left it out, still had plenty of juice to go with. I'm surprised that Victoria didn't think about how <sighs> it's it's about Nick. It's about her relationship with her brother. Why would she do that to her brother? Why would she do that to her brother's kids? You know, she's an aunt to Summer and and even and Faith to an extent too. Why would you knowingly allow this drama in the family? I mean, it's good for us. <laughs> but still, I thought, well, what the heck? And Nick confronted Victoria about it and said, you know, what's up with this? Why are you letting this happen? Your husband is out of control. And Victoria proceeded to have this argument back to Nick basically saying Phyllis has done this to everyone else so why can't we do it to her which I totally get that logic I, I, that makes sense to me but you weren't complaining <laughs> when Phyllis's stories were helping sell your husband's magazines you weren't complaining when it helped his bottom line bringing in cash to your family so I, I, I don't know Maybe I, I, I just am a little bit I'm just a little bit surprised at Victoria and Nick went as far as to accuse Victoria of having some issues with Phyllis still about Lucy and then maybe that that's why Victoria was giving Billy the okay to do this because again Victoria was the last line of defense on this if she would have put her foot down I think things would have been differently I don't think Billy would be doing this I think that Victoria is the one that gave him the green light and so he's he's going for it but is it entirely outside of the realm of possibility that Victoria might still be holding on to some bitterness toward Phyllis about Lucy? Hmm? I ask you. I leave you with that. I think that that might very well be the case, but it's beside the point. I don't even care because I really, really like where this is going. Um, it was a nice break from the courtroom scenes or the court jail scenes, um, although it wasn't an entire break from it. This week, Brett Butler showed back up on the show. I don't know 
the character's name. It was Dr. Reed's, the super of Dr. Reed's building. And she showed up at the police station to co collaborate uh, the story that, uh, like, Ricky was there with uh, visiting Dr. Reed. And also, she was able to positively identify Phyllis as having been at Dr. Reed's apartment. And she went on about how mean Phyllis was and that she was, you know, out, she was out, she, she was venomous or whatever, you know, she made Phyllis sound, sound to be, you know, out to be really, really bad. And of course, it, Chris, Chris slashed onto this and realized that this really doesn't have anything to do with Ricky. Dr. Reed has disappeared and Phyllis probably had something to do with it. Like, if anything has gone going wrong in Genoa City, Chris is ready to jump on Phyllis about it. I, I, I don't blame her, but all of a sudden, it sort of developed into this did Phyllis murder Dr. Reed thing. Ronan actually went to question Phyllis about it, which, again, Ronan, why are you paying so much attention to Phyllis and not attention to Paul? Ooh, we'll talk about that later. But he goes to Phyllis and just straight up asks her, uh, did you kill Dr. Reed? <laughs> and Phyllis smacks him. Doesn't even take a minute to consider. Her reaction is, screw you, smack. <laughs> when Ronan has been like the one person who's helping her out from the inside, Ronan is on the surface, being there for her a little bit more than Michael is, but she just took major offense to that, like, which she always does, whether she's done something or not, she acts offended when somebody calls her on it. You know, if you can accuse her of running over Paul and Christine with her car, but the Dr. Reed thing, she's so offended. But I, I it's kind of becoming ridiculous. Phyllis got called in called into the station to answer questions about what happened with Dr. Reed. And of course, Chris is there the entire time poking and prodding. Chris really doesn't even have any place being in the questioning room, but she's there anyway, clearly with a vendetta. And I don't think Chris is wrong. I really don't. Uh, Phyllis has done her wrong. Phyllis tried to kill her. Come on, I don't know how anybody could overlook that. Phyllis <laughs> tried to kill Chris, so I can understand where she's coming from, but I also just, in general, think that Chris needs to be focusing more on Paul. That's the aspect of this that bothers me. Like, Chris, I, I get that you want to focus on Phyllis's case, but Paul's sitting there in jail, rotting, and, and you're not really doing anything to help him. I, how much longer is Paul going to be in that orange jumpsuit? How much longer is are we gonna drag this out? Are we gonna drag it out for another nine months, like the Diane Jenkins murder? Uh, 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 like, let's just get on it. Let's find the knife. Let's recover Eden's memory and get on with it. It's over. It's over. Paul doesn't need to be sitting in jail. It's just wasting time. And Heather is actually starting to come out of her shell a little bit and fight for her father because certainly no one else is. And Heather even encouraged Paul this week to just fire Chris. She's too focused on Phyllis. She's not focused on you. I agree. I think Chris being emotionally attached to all of these situations is hurting more than it's helping. So fire Chris, get somebody else, an independent lawyer who can actually look at the facts, who can put on some pressure. Chris hasn't done that at all for him. And it, it needs to happen. And I was pretty impressed with with Heather this week actually standing up for Paul and against Christine and trying to get him to do that. And if that's like... Uh, Heather, where is everyone in Genoa City when Paul is sitting in jail? This, this, is, this ticks me off. I don't mean to tangent too much. But Paul is always there for everyone. Where are they for him? For one thing, Michael and Lauren are just keeping their mouths shut about the fact that he got the gun from Lauren. I, wouldn't that kind of establish something? I mean, wouldn't that at least show that it wasn't premeditated? He got the gun away from Lauren to help her. So it's not like he went out and purchased a gun to go premeditatedly kill his son, and not to mention the fact that he shot him in the arm. Paul could easily have shot him in the chest. It was not a kill shot. It was so clearly not intended. I'm so annoyed that Paul is sitting in jail right now. Where's Victor? 
convict or not pull a few strings to help a brother out? What? Where's Where's Nikki? They were engaged once. They were close friends. If Nikki needed Paul, Paul would be there in a heartbeat. Where is she when he needs him? It just annoys me. <laughs> mm. Well, back to Phyllis. I've tangented enough. She gets questioned about the whole Dr. Reed situation, and finally, because they're acting like she killed him, she decides to confess that she actually just paid him to get out of town, which is exactly something that Phyllis would do. Unfortunately, that makes her look more guilty. It makes it look like she, Reed knew something. He knew something about this hit and run that was going to hurt her, so rather than deal with it, she just paid him to get out of town. So it sucks for her because she ended up telling the truth, but I guess it was a, a lesser problem. I mean, what do you want to do? Do you want to deal with them thinking that you killed him or you want to give them fuel for the hit and run case because that's what it ended up being, especially when we saw just a brief little scene after all this had gone down, where Brett Butler, the super, uh, the, the, the landlord lady, uh, gets on a, a cell phone call at Crimson Lights to Dr. Reed, who is sitting off on a beach somewhere enjoying a pina colada. <laughs> uh, probably watching a, a TV screen and hearing all of this news about Phyllis and realizing that she's in deep with this hit and run case and he probably just decided to fan the flames send the super in there to make it look like she was even more guilty I mean, he he doesn't have anything to lose this point he's got her money he's like living a nice life and he's got the information he can continue to take money from her as long as he wants so he can have her money and he can, might as well fan the flames and get this woman who he really hates in trouble even more so Dr. Reed is really in a good position now he's basically <laughs> having his brownie and eating it too. Samantha's obviously alive, right? She's still alive. That's basically where we're where we're headed with this. <laughs> I assume we've had a lot of her mystery hand. Someone's mystery hand. <laughs> it's gotta be Samantha. She's gotta still be alive, right? <sighs> I wish we would just focus on the cast that we have, honestly. It could be interesting to see Kane's sister, but at the same time, I'm like, another new person? I can't focus. <laughs> I was supposed to focus on all of these new people. I was just thinking, like, today, or the other day, where the heck did Kyle go? All of a sudden, Kyle came back onto the scene, and he was he was all about uh, Jack and Nikki, and that was his whole thing. And then he just disappeared for weeks. And Fen, where'd Fen go? It just Why even cast these people? <laughs> So I don't know if Samantha's just sneaking around in the background and she's not going to become a, a major player or if she is. No clue. But it appears to me that she's still alive on top of all of the little clues that we've gotten before. The email, the, the Swiss francs, um, <sighs> Genevieve got her room tossed. This week she comes back to her room at the athletic club. Everything is tossed upside down and there are these weird little clues, thing, you know, like a picture, for instance, in a picture frame of the family, like Kane and Caleb and Samantha and Colin and Genevieve, and the picture frame is, cr you know, cracked, but the picture's in it, and just things that Genevieve wouldn't have seen in a long time, and probably things that Sam only Samantha would, kn would know or would have. It didn't look like Colin would have been behind it, plus we have the mystery hand. So I just, I, I have to assume that it's Samantha. I don't know why that Kane was able to go to Kevin to help find out what was up with the bank records in the Swiss bank account, but he didn't think to go to the athletic club and check the security cameras. The security cameras caught outside of Ricky's door, th throwing away the, Ev the Daisy's wallet and her cell phone and all that stuff. So surely there's security cameras outside of the rooms at the athletic club. Why doesn't somebody just look at those and then we'll figure out if Samantha's alive or not? I don't know. I think it would probably have been more interesting if Genevieve was doing it to herself. There was that implication this week a little bit. Kane had started to doubt her and wondered if she was just creating this drama on her own. And Lily was mad at him about that. Which again, I don't know when Lily became the huge Genevieve supporter. She used to couldn't stand her. Now all of a sudden she's really, really trying to get Kane and his mom to be 
close again, best friends, but um, I just think it kind of would have been more interesting <laughs> if Genevieve would have done that to herself. I just, I, I like the idea of schizo Genevieve, but I guess the other option is Tucker. Like, Tucker seems to be somehow involved here. I'm not entirely sure. I wonder if maybe... If so, okay, if Samantha's alive, she faked her own death. And if she faked her own death, is it possible that she had some kind of help from Tucker? Uh, it was established this week that not only did Tucker and Genevieve know each other in the past when they were kids, but there was an interaction between them in Australia. Tucker went to Australia, basically asked Genevieve to come back to him, and she tried, and it didn't work out, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I can't help it, you guys. I just... I feel a little bit like this is kind of being pulled out of our ass, the little Tucker and Genevieve thing. They've both been in town together for a year, probably, and now all of a sudden there was this deep love. There was no awkwardness between them. It was very, like, hello and cordial forever, and now all of a sudden there's some deep, deep problems between them, and I'm just, and I'm just like, I don't know, I, uh, it kind of makes me space out a little bit. But I wonder if it is possible that Tucker could have helped Samantha fake her own death somehow. He's obviously very, very bitter uh, toward Genevieve. There's some bad blood between them. He was so angry this week that he like grabbed it. He was having a glass of scotch and, and then he talked with Genevieve and then after that was done he crushed the glass with his hand and his hand was all bloody. So it kind of implies that Tucker could have it out for Genevieve in a bad way or in a violent way. I don't know. I don't think he's doing this. I don't think he's necessarily working with Samantha. But he must know something about it. I don't know. It's hard. How can you even put together the pieces on this when there, it's just being made up? There's, like, there's, no, there's no other connecting points. It's just sort of like, okay, well, I guess then Genevieve and Tucker knew each other. You know what I mean? There's no other clues. It's just sort of being thrown at us as it comes. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. The, the way that the bad blood is being shown between them makes me think that they're headed toward a Genevieve and Tucker romance. I, I'm sorry! I love Tucker and Ashley, and I never got the impression that he was hung up, hung up on Genevieve at all during their marriage. I didn't get that impression at all! I thought Tucker was completely Ashley's, and now all of a sudden, it seems like he's he's... Uh, he could possibly have Ashley back, but he really wants Genevieve. It just, I don't get it. I don't, it feels inconsistent to me. Am I the only one? Probably. But I know that the way they're building up this tension between Tucker and Genevieve, it's got to build into a romance. Like, he's paying for her to stay at the athletic club. He's giving her money for nothing, and Genevieve's ripping him a new one because he won't give her a job, as if he wants to keep her under her thumb. Which, I'm sorry, Genevieve, that's your baggage from Colin. I don't think that's what Tucker's doing. I think Tucker was just trying to help you out. Like, he's giving you money, not asking for anything in return, and... He's the one with the problem? Why? <laughs> I just, I don't get that vibe from it. I think that she's making that out of nothing. I, I mean, if she's she's yelling at Tucker, telling him that she, he needs to give her a job uh, because she's got valuable experience and she wants to earn her keep. Well, I'm sorry, Genevieve, if you've got so much valuable work experience, then why don't you get a job somewhere else? <laughs> there are other companies in Genoa City. Oh yeah, the reason you don't get a job somewhere else is because you burned all your other bridges. You burned all your bridges with Jack, so you can't work at Beauty of Nature, you can't work at Jabot, you burned your bridges with Newman, so you can't work there. Uh, what else is left for you at this point? I still hate so much that Ashley is leaving the show. It really bothers me. I don't know how she's going to leave the show. Do you guys have any predictions? They're kind of 
sealing up the relationship with Tucker, establishing that they're not going to get back together because he's so into Genevieve. And also, she's going head to head with Jack on this business issue. So I'm not sure if Jack's going to end up winning against her. She's she's threatening to take him to the board for uh, owning one company and being at the head of a competing company. And I don't know if Jack's going to end up winning and she's just going to decide to leave town or if they're going to do it in a different way. Just please, Weiner, please tell me, please tell me that this is not going to result in some in Ashley like, getting hurt or disappearing and everybody not knowing where she is because I can't handle that. If she needs to go off Go to New York, be with Tracy, regather her thoughts in her life. That's fine. I can. I, that's the way that I can most deal with this. But please just write her off quietly. Don't kill her. Don't do anything weird. I hope t they're not going to try to make Tucker try to hurt her. Or, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. He's messing around with signing the divorce papers. So I don't know if he's going to get obsessy. I'm not sure. But I thought that... They had a little scene at Glowworm this week where they were trying to decide if they could possibly be friends, which I think is fine. Yes, Tucker screwed her over. I wouldn't I wouldn't get back together with him. I don't think she should get to get back together with him at this point, but at the same time, they did love each other. They do love each other. Just because you screw one of you screws up doesn't mean that the love just disappears and goes away. You still have it and you still are allowed to go through your grieving process. And Abby walks in, sees Ashley and Tucker talking, flies off the handle and pulls Ashley to the side and starts scolding her. First of all, Abby, you are in no position no position to scold your mother. You don't have this, you don't have the life experience that she does, you don't have the knowledge that she does, you don't have a leg to stand on. And it bothered me that Abby was like shaming Ashley into not going back to Tucker, which I don't think Ashley was going to do anyway. I can understand Abby saying, I think this is a bad idea, I really, I think you should stay away from him and he's not good for you. But the way Abby approached it was so aggressive and um, almost, she was like almost talking down at her mom. Mom, I didn't like it. I just thought, well, well, like, who are you? <laughs> who are you to judge or, or to, to, to say anything to her? Like, it's hypocritical, you know? It's not like your life is totally on track, and you can't b continue to blame your parents for things that have happened when you were a child. Ashley's an adult. She can make her own decisions. And besides, Abby, it's not like you have the world's greatest taste in men. I mean, Carmine is hot, but he tried to kidnap Chloe. Yeah, tried to kidnap Chloe. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, Tucker never tried to kidnap anybody that I can recall, unless he kidnaps Ashley. <laughs> so I don't know where all of a sudden Abby gets off. But are you guys, so are you guys enjoying Abby and Carmine, are you into it? Uh, there was a lot of shirtless scenes with Carmine this week, and I think I looked at him for the first time this week and realized his arms are huge. Huge! Like, he's got muscles on his arm. Like, like it brings new meaning to the, to the slang term guns. Like, he's got two big old missiles hanging from his shoulder sockets. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and obviously that's exactly what Abby likes. She's eating it up with a spoon. They're having sex all over the place. This week they had car sex, which, by the way, car sex only sounds good in theory. <laughs> That is not comfortable. That looked like a little car. Where did they even do it? You know, there's a steering wheel in the driver's seat. The passenger seat doesn't have a heck of a lot more room, and that looked like a little red car that didn't have a back seat. So I don't know how they pulled it off. <laughs> but, you know, congratulations to them if they were able to do it. But again, it's not like Abby has some amazing track record with men that she can just judge Ashley on. And, you know, likewise, I thought it was interesting how Ashley tried to give Sharon a little bit of advice about Victor this week. Ashley ran into Sharon, and I, you know, I, talk, I took it to be something good. I think that 
Ashley does care about Sharon. She cares about Faith. And she didn't push. You know, she didn't try to shame Sharon. She just kind of gently warned her and told her of her experience with Victor. And she said, you know, if you think that you're going to replace Nikki or that you're going to somehow earn some new place in Victor's heart, then you're wrong. I mean, at, at, at least a Ashley learned that from her mistake. You know, I mean, she, Abby accused her, Abby accused Ashley of making the same mistake over and over with men, just letting them treat you poorly and then going back to them, which I can see that point. It's a valid point if she would have made it in a mature way. But at the same time, Ashley did learn that mistake with Victor. She's just kind of still learning it with Tucker. But I, I mean, Nikki hasn't even learned that lesson. It's sort of a, it's a weird group mentality or something. Nikki still goes back to Victor even though it never works out. He always treats her poorly. It's like, it feels like all of these women are like stuck in this same pattern forever. I got so many really nice comments last week about my Adam and Chelsea rant. It was really nice to realize that I'm not alone in what I'm feeling, but even the people who like Adam and Chelsea were really nice and respectful and, you know, said we can agree to disagree, which is so cool of you guys. I'm really grateful. Like, I don't know. You guys are just awesome. You're level-headed. You're you're all very mature. It's, it's um, very refreshing because I just had this bad feeling that I was going to get flamed because I know that the fans are passionate and I'll go on Twitter and every single person is tweeting about how much they love Chelsea and Adam and it does make me feel isolated especially because this is my show I love this show I've been watching it since I was 15 I'm coming up on 20 years watching this show and I'm you know me I'm pretty laid back I, I pretty much like everything there's not a whole lot that I that I really rail against in an angry fan kind of way. And I do feel that way about Adam and Chelsea. I just feel like Adam and Chelsea are a sticky syrup that is like being poured down our throats, like shoving it down our throats. And it's so sweet. Like a sweetness, a sweetness is best when taken lightly, just a, a touch on the end of the tongue with sweetness. I don't need it jammed down my throat on a daily basis. And that's what I feel like I'm getting. They have decided to completely transform the character of Adam, which I, I like him being sweet. I really do. I think it's nice. But he's just bordering on saint. Like all of a sudden he's he has to tell the truth about everything and he has to be above board. And Chelsea just has no discernible personality to me whatsoever. She's just a little cupcake you know, which is fine if it was like real life, but it's a TV show. <laughs> it's so boring to me. And it's never, ever sexual. Most of their scenes are just schmooky, 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 That's like the schmoopy uh, Seinfeld episode. That's all it is. It, and it, it makes me ill. It physically makes me ill. And now they have a house together. Like, I, I'm not, you're just going to have to know, I'm not going to be able to blow by blow it for you. I, I don't, I, I'm not gonna go, ooh, they went in the hotel and there was a mouse. Now oh my gosh, she got the mouse for her. And wasn't that cute how he got that mouse for her? And I'm not gonna talk incessantly, you know, how he carries her over the, uh, whatever, the, uh, carries her into the new house that he just bought. Like, now they've got this new house. They're living in Genevieve's old place. I don't understand what two people need 10 bedrooms and 12 bathrooms and 40 acres for and I don't know why all of a sudden Chelsea gets to be the lady of the manor. She's a new character who really hasn't done anything. I don't have anything against her like she's some horrible character and that's why I don't like her. She just is boring. That's that's my argument. It's just she's just boring to me. Adam is all fire and 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 brash and he's all business and intense and he's got so many different sides to him and she feels one dimensional to me I don't I don't feel that the character has been developed you know in a way that's supposed to make me want her with Adam so I don't get why all of a sudden she gets to be the lady of the manor like uh, the, for also like I'm sorry the pretty woman thing is so over 
he bought her dresses, he's surprising her with all these things, and she's she's never had any money, she's poor, she's never had um, the, the, the benefit of family or, uh, I don't know, having a, a one home to live in, and just, it's, it, it's pretty woman is what it is, and it's been done, it feels boring to me, and I'm not falling for it, I'm sorry, I'm just not falling for it. Um, the one thing I will give them, though, and I think Adam and Chelsea fans will appreciate this, because I can acknowledge this. I do think that Chelsea does accept him for who he is. Adam, is, as a character, has spent a lot of time trying to skirt who he is. He's tried to outrun who he is. And Chelsea doesn't try to make him into something else. She accepts him for who he is. And I do appreciate that about them. I think one of the other things that sours me a little bit against this storyline and this pairing is just the fact that I don't care about Anita and, and Jeff and Gloria. I, I care about Gloria. Gloria is the one I care, care about the most, but nothing has been done with her. She just is comic relief. They're, Gloria is, is also kind of one-dimensional. We haven't seen a whole lot of depth from her. I mean, all Gloria and J Jeff and Anita are, are, I don't know, stupid. They're just, just stupidness. It's not... It, it doesn't feel like drama. It doesn't feel like depth at all. I, I just straight up can't stand Anita. I don't like her face. I don't like anything she says. I don't like who the character is. I don't particularly like the actress. Just, it's, it feels dumbed down a little bit for me. I could potentially care about Jeff and a, um, uh, what do you call it? I don't know, him being married polygamy. A, a Jeff polygamy storyline could possibly be interesting if it were focused on in and of itself, and also if it were somebody other than Anita, someone who's not disgusting. Do, do you even see Jeff and Anita ever having been together? I can't even see it. They don't even look like they ever would have been together, ever. Um, so, so that just doesn't appeal to me. Uh, and also because I realize that it's just there as a prop for Chelsea and Adam. That whole Gloria, Jeff, Anita storyline is just there to create drama for Chelsea and Adam, which is supposed to just work to garner more support for them. You know, the, they have to have something to struggle against or, you know, people will get bored. And to me, it's just not enough. It's just not enough at all. So I, you know, like I said, I have my reasons and you guys have your reasons for liking them. And, and you know, it's cool. It's, it's all good. It's just... It feels a little bit out of left field for me. Um, there was this scene this week where Chloe and Kevin come to Adam to try to name the new website. And Chelsea's there hanging around in the background doing nothing as usual. And this time, though, they're all trying to uh, brainstorm names. Nobody's coming up with anything. And all of a sudden, Chelsea decides to throw in her two cents. And she comes up with a couple of concepts, which are all fine and good. I mean, at, at the end, she ended up just kind of saying, how about tag and grab? Uh, you know, the, the names she came up with were like everybody acted like it was brilliance sheer brilliance tag and grab oh yes yeah, she's a genius tag and grab yes that's it and I'm not trying to be a jerk I think everybody has creative ideas and they're all fine I mean I don't think tag and grab is some kind of genius name that we need to like kiss her butt about like I I hate the way they are propping Chelsea up just because she thought of a name, woohoo! I mean, after that scene, they had Chloe and Kevin separately going back to Glowworm and Chloe commenting on, uh, like, how Chelsea is so good. Like, oh yeah, she's actually really good. So what? She thought of a name. <laughs> Why is that a big deal? It just, I think, give me a break. It's transparent writing. It's clearly there so that we start to think of Chelsea as the intellectual equal to Adam that I talked about last week. And it's just not working for me. Not working. <laughs> but you already know that. <laughs> I'm probably going to continue to complain about them week after week. I'm sorry. But, you know, it is, it is on my mind. At least I'm talking about it. It's getting me talking. Whether I like it or not, it's getting me talking. But... 
Anyway, I thought that one of the other interesting elements here this week was, and I knew this was coming, what's going to happen when Adam and Chelsea get back to Genoa City and run into Victor and Sharon? Because Adam ran into Victor this week, and there was a lot of pleasantries, actually. Victor was like, hey, good for you, you got married, which I think... Victor's just happy that Adam is staying to keep Adam away from Sharon, but Victor was very complimentary, like, oh, congratulations, Jill, oh, well, well done. And Adam, new Adam, who decides he has to tell the truth about everything, decides to tell Victor that Sharon was in Kansas. He says, there's something you ought to know. Sharon was in Kansas. And first of all, I just, why did he even have to tell Victor? Is he trying to protect Sharon? Is he trying to protect Victor? Is he just compelled to tell the truth now? Um, I, I don't know. But Victor just looked at him and said, I know, son. And walked away. And I was like, good. Don't give him the satisfaction. I don't want to hear him explain the whole story to Victor about how Sharon said she'd leave Victor in heart. Like, I don't want to hear it. It's been, it's just over. It's just over. And simultaneously, though, probably, uh, you know, actually, no. The thing I want to mention, too that really kind of killed me. And again, this is not for me about Sharon and Adam, but during that conversation with Victor and Adam, during the pleasantries, Adam actually said to Victor, you know, I'm happy for the first time since mom died. Like, wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Because did I just imagine everything that happened? between Adam and Sharon? I don't think so. Is that all just gone now? Erased from the landscape? He never really loved Sharon? He was never really happy with Sharon? Are you freaking kidding me? You're, you're kidding me, right? Because I don't care, again, I don't care if Adam and Sharon get back together. It probably is better if they don't. But you're happy for the first time since your mom died? Uh, so, the, so basically, let me just make sure I get this right. Since you've come onto the show, because the character of Adam came onto the show as Hope was dying. So since you've been on the show, everything's happened with Sharon. You were never happy. Never. <laughs> Just want to make sure I, I got it right, you know? It bothers me. I, I, don't act like Sharon never existed, okay, Adam? Don't act like you never proclaimed your ever love for her. Don't act like you didn't follow her to New Orleans. Don't act like you didn't pursue her. It happened! Why is it just being erased from the landscape? That's what bothers me! It's just being forgotten, pushed aside, to prop up Chelsea and Adam because everybody's going, ooh, goo goo gaga! It, it, it makes me sick. It really makes me sick. And it bothers me just even, like, in a, um, uh, uh, a linear sense, like, uh, consistency sense for writing, for storylines. It just bugged me. Um, but... I thought Victor's non-reaction to the whole thing was pretty good. And then Sharon and Chelsea had a confrontation. And I'm sure everybody else was loving Chelsea kind of giving it to Sharon because they ran into each other and Chelsea basically told Sharon, don't you ever try to come in between me and Adam again. And I'm sure all the fans were like, yeah, go Chelsea. But I was like, Sharon, just smack her in the face, will you? <laughs> just, just beat her down. <laughs> like, I agree that Sharon needs to move on. And I don't think Chelsea's wrong for confronting Sharon. It's just, I have, I can't help it. My loyalty is to Sharon, I'm sorry. My loyalty is gonna be to the veteran character. My loyalty is gonna be to the character who's been on the show since I started watching. Excuse me, you know? That, that I just don't chuck Sharon aside because Chelsea comes in and has been here for a couple of months and is now married to Adam, who's my favorite character, who is becoming less and less my favorite character as he just becomes whitewashed and boring. Um, <laughs> I was pretty glad, though, and, like, I, I, I was pretty interested by the fact that rather than, like, smacking Chelsea, which is what I would like to have seen, Sharon steals her lipstick. Steals her lipstick and then is seen in a scene later putting it on. Hmm. Creepily. Really, really creepily. I, I, I just looked at it like, damn, Sharon, damn. Damn. <laughs> Girl, you are really, really, really off the deep end at this point. <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird. Um, but I 
want to ask one. I want to close by asking one question. Because we all know who Chelsea is. She's like a, a, a family of grifters. She came into town trying to grift Billy. And as much as you might like Chelsea and Adam, is it a coincidence all of a sudden she was able to get in close to him? She couldn't get Billy what she wanted. But she got in close with Adam. Now all of a sudden she's kind of getting everything that she wanted from Billy. Like a really nice house. She's kind of a millionaire. She's living the millionaire lifestyle. This is kind of what they always wanted since they got into town. Her and Anita. And my question for you is, is there any chance, any chance, you guys, that Chelsea is grifting Adam? Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. It is the end of a YNR era. This week we had some major news, and I don't usually talk about this or get into this, but the head writer at YNR, Maria Arena Bell, who is the sister-in-law of Bill Bell Jr., who, uh, whose father created The Young and the Restless and The Bold and the Beautiful, has been fired. So the head writer was fired, like abruptly let go from YNR. And she had been there, I believe, for five years in control. Like she had been writing in, in, in the head writer or um, at, a, at a high level writing position at YNR for the last five years. And I had heard things here and there about fans kind of being outraged with her or the direction that she was taking the show. And it kind of seems like maybe Sony was thinking so too. They just straight up canned her. And the reason why, like I normally wouldn't really pay, I don't normally pay attention to who the writers are. I know there were a couple, like Lynn Marie Latham I know was a very much hated head writer at YNR. And she killed John Abbott for crying out loud. I mean, there there's... Always, like, these new writers come in and they think they, they probably have something to prove and they want to make it bold and <clears throat> and and so things change. And, and fans, I think, are sensitive. Uh, yet, uh, this has stuck out to me particularly now because I kind of have been getting a little, like, annoyed with YNR more than I have in the past. You know, again, you know me, I'm pretty laid back. And... It, it takes me a while to get angry about things. <laughs> like, I'm not, I don't have my finger on the pulse of the community by any chance. I'm just me. I just watch here in my little bubble. I don't talk to a whole lot of people but besides you guys about YNR. So, um, but like by the time that I start to get annoyed, something must kind of be up. Because when I think about it, I think that there are some genuine complaints to be had with the show right now. And I don't want to be, like, super complainy, but I want to see what you guys think about this. Because, like, just one thing that sticks out that really, where I started to get really disgruntled, was the Diane murder mystery. It took them nine months to figure that out, and then they resolved it in a totally ridiculous way. And that really, really ticked me off. But, like, even bringing it into, like, that's unacceptable, you know? But even bringing it into the current situation, I, there are characters that are on the show, that have always been on the show, that I've known for nearly 20 years, that I don't recognize now. And I think probably the one that's really sticking out to me the most is Sharon. Like, I love bitchy Sharon. I thought it was awesome this week, actually, when she had that confrontation with Nikki at Lauren's boutique. Nikki's picking out her wedding dress, and Sharon said, "Why, really? That that didn't really even apply at your first wedding." <laughs> that was so good. Like I love that Sharon's getting a backbone, but who is this woman at the same time? I don't recognize her. I feel that she's really been damaged. It seems like the fans kind of hate her now. I don't know. It, it, and it's really just been since she kind of broke up with Adam. I don't know. I think people probably started hating her when she got with Adam and then it got worse when she broke up with Adam and even worse when she got with Victor. But I don't recognize her behavior. Um, I, I'm having a harder time connecting with Sharon. And she is a veteran character. She's a leading lady. I've known her forever. I want to like Sharon. I want, like, I just feel that Sharon's character has been damaged. Really damaged. And by the same token, I do think that there have been some kind of blatant mistakes made with the character of Phyllis, too. Like, first of all, there are a lot of people that love her. There are a lot of people that hate her. And 
it kind of makes me think, like, why why does she have to be in every single scene? I think that Phyllis has been overused. They've pushed, she's excellent, Michelle Suffer is excellent, but they've pushed her into the forefront so hard. She's in, like, every storyline that I think people just got sick of her. It's more for people to pick at. You know, there's more things that they can find, to, more reasons to hate her when she's out front all the time. So, and as far with the hit and run thing, and uh, just everything, it's like, I think that they're making it harder to like the characters that we want to like. And I like both Sharon and Phyllis, absolutely. But at the, at the same time, I'm like, well, what the heck is happening? Why do they keep doing this? And I feel similarly about Victor. Victor, for crying out loud, it's becoming increasingly diff difficult to like him. He's barely on the show, and when he is, he's being a jerk. Where's the redeeming quality for Victor? It almost seems like the show has been focusing so much on new characters and kind of casting the old ones aside. Like Chelsea or Genevieve or you know, like Kane or and even though I, I like Kane, but at the same time, why build up new characters and let the old ones fall by the wayside? I want to love Victor. I've known him so long and he's such a like a great a great character to look up to and he's like the leader. He's still the main leading man and he's it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to like him. And I don't know why they've paired him with Sharon. I don't I don't know a single person that likes Sharon and Victor together. Everybody is like, ew, he's old enough to be your grandfather, nobody's into it, and they're still forcing through with it? Sharon has become so isolated, they've clearly got Adam and Chelsea together, clearly Nick and Phyllis back together, and Sharon's just isolated. Why stick her with Victor? Why not bring somebody else new on for her, or find Jack, or freaking somebody else? Why blaze that trail? Why keep blazing on with Victor and Sharon when there have been other chances to get her out of that relationship and they don't do it? I don't understand. And furthermore, why continue to keep Victor and Nikki going in this circle, go, dancing in this dance and keeping them apart? Why? I mean, at this point, I don't even want Victor and Nikki back together, and I love Victor and Nikki. So, that has almost been damaged beyond repair. They've, Victor's such a jerk that why would I even want Nikki to be with him? <laughs> why, for the love of God, can't they just let Victor and Nikki be together and be happy and give them other challenges? Does the challenge have to be their relationship? Like, you don't have to do the same storyline over and over for them in order to keep them on screen. Nikki could get a job. Victor could have another venture. Who knows? You're a writer. You're supposed to be creative. Figure it out. Why does it have to constantly be Nikki and Victor hit and miss? I'm tired of it. I love Jack. He's been in a freaking wheelchair for the last several months. How boring. <laughs> like, get Jack out of that freaking wheel. Who decided to put Jack in a wheelchair, really? <laughs> Why can't Jack have love? The one chance he had with love recently that seemed really, really mutual was with Emily, and they got rid of her and then brought Patty back. <laughs> that made no sense. <laughs> I would love it if Nikki and Jack could live happily ever after, but she still loves Victor. She still loves Victor, so therefore I just don't know how it's ever going to work out. So I don't understand that. Adam was this hugely popular character. I loved him so much. I don't even recognize him right now at all. He's changed so much within the last month or two that I don't recognize him. Ever since he got his sight back, it was like a rebirth. I don't know this guy. It's taken away all the things that I love about Adam. Yeah, I wanted him to be a little bit more on the good side. I didn't want him to be as schemy as he was, but I didn't want him to become an angel. I, like, the, the halo around his head is blinding to me. I don't understand that. And it, 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 it bothers me. It bothers me that a character that I really like and have liked for a long time is now unrecognizable to me. I don't understand why some of the decisions that have been made have been made. I think another really good uh, example is Ronan. Ever, like, most people seem to like Ronan. He's been a pretty popular character, but they don't use him. They don't use him in the right way. Why 
do they refuse to explore his relationship with Nina? Why do they refuse to give him another side? Fans have been asking, asking, asking for more depth from Ronan and it never happens. Fans have been asking for Chloe and Ronan and it never happened. Instead, Chloe and Kevin, which I don't know anybody, again, that is really a huge Kevin and Chloe fan. I mean, I'm sure there are a couple out there, but if you ask me, Kevin and Chloe are not a good fit. Uh, Chloe has basically chopped off Kevin's balls. Kevin has no balls anymore. Kevin's barely a man anymore. He's just a walking hairdo. <laughs> She, he, every time she does something that he's annoyed with, she, he's just like, oh, Chloe. You know, like, he can't do any better. He's so whipped. He's so whipped. And I don't think that's what Chloe needs. I think that Chloe needs somebody who she can push back against or that's going to push her, you know? I mean, like Ronan, for instance, would not let her chop his balls off. Ronan would be pushing back on her and creating a challenge for the relationship and a challenge for the viewer and igniting a spark. And instead, it's not. Kevin and Chloe are Boarsville for me. Ronan is just off in his little unit. I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, pairing him with Phyllis was hot sex, but again, I think it just made more people dislike Phyllis. Why does she have to be up in everything? Why does she have to be in every and with everybody so I, I like I think they've overused her and underused him and I think that the cast has become so big <laughs> that I can't even keep track of it anymore I'm like wh wh who's going who it seems like they're always getting rid of somebody I like and then bringing on somebody that I, I don't care about it takes time to establish a character it takes time for people to start liking a character and I don't I don't know why I don't, I don't feel right now there's so many new people and 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 no focus on the veterans like where's Jill I mean I know that uh, that the actress is off kind of doing a family thing and that's totally cool but she hasn't been on the forefront for a long time where's Catherine where are the veterans it just feels like it's the cast has become so ballooned focusing a little bit on so many other little people when I just wish that they would focus on the cast that they have I wish that they would focus on a few things rather than a bunch of little things I wish that they would focus on the, the storylines that they know they can make good do well what you know how to do well and stop getting all crazy <laughs> but those are my thoughts. I want to know what you guys think about that. What do you think about the firing? What do you think this means? Are there going to be more firings coming? How, how does this change? How do you feel about the, the new head writer was named? She uh, apparently has worked f in soaps for a long time, but a head writer. But even that concerns me because I'm like, well, all the other soaps haven't survived. Why would you bring somebody on? Like, she got fired as a head writer for being the head writer at, I think, General Hospital. So, <laughs> is she really a good choice? So, I just don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. You know, I worry about the future of the show because I love it so much. It all comes from love. And, um, I, I just, I worry about it. And I don't know what any of this change means. I know it's change, and I'm not afraid of change. I think it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen. But we're going to see some new things happening. I think within the next probably six to eight weeks, you're going to start to see a difference um, in how things are being handled, and I just hope it's for the better. Okay, that brings me to the end. <laughs> I have ranted and raved for long enough, <laughs> and now it is your turn, my friends. Please, Leave me a comment. You can talk about anything. Talk about the storylines, talk about the cast, talk about the head writer. I'm so curious to know what you guys think about all of the drama that's going on on screen and behind the scenes. Leave me a comment. Let me know your thoughts. I'm totally going to be reading and responding. I can't wait. And I'm going to be back next week. We'll be back next week. Chat about everything and uh, we'll see how we feel then. <laughs> I love you guys. Have a good one. Bye.